मुझे यहाँ आना ही था क्योंकि सुनील जी का जीवन बहुत इंस्पायरिंग रहा है और उससे भी ज़्यादा इंस्पायरिंग उनकी जो उनके जो विचार थे वो रहे हैं एक अलग प्रकार के समाज के लिए अलग प्रकार के वास्तव के लिए अलग प्रकार का अलग प्रकार की राजनीति हो तो उस वो करने का तरीका भी अलग होना चाहिए ये सोच मुझे बड़ी पसंद आती है और इस सोच को लेके ही मैं आपके सामने कुछ बातें रखना चाहता हूँ मेरे लिए ये बड़ा सम्मान है कि आपने सोचा मुझे बुलाए मैं आपका बहुत आभारी हूँ धन्यवाद देना चाहता हूँ फ्रेंड्स आई एम नॉट हियर टू परसुएड यू टू माई पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू I am not going to present to you any earth-shattering new point of view, expecting you to agree with it. I am here in the hope that while speaking to an assembly like this, probably the most intelligent of the countries. youth if i present a serious issue in a serious way and hope that in future you might take some strands from these and investigate them and come out with proper results i would then feel happy grateful as an old man standing at the, at the threshold of vismruti <clears throat> the title i chose is linguistic diversity and the making of india i was asking myself what is this making of india this is not make in india by the way <laughs> that is only value addition it's not innovation <clears throat> uh making of india how is india made who made it maine rhetorically bahut baar suna hai ki ye hindustan ya bharat ya india aap jis bhi naam se use pukarte ho wo kya hai wais nadiya hai ya parvat hai all the rhetoric i heard with great admiration for rhetoric but i thought i would think more coolly as to when india was made and where it was made i am not getting into the question of who made it and to my mind the answer is india got made several times over i just want to run through that and while i do that i would like to add some information about what language was doing at that time every time india was being made what was language doing what languages were doing to that because it is a broad brush portrayal of our past please do not expect me to provide every minute detail there is another space and another time and other forum for doing that so here is my broad brush picture of how india was made and i said india was made several times over not at the same place at different locations i'll go back to the uh, without uh, without taking up the question of origin i'll go back to the earliest known memory of our people indians and that earliest known memory comes from genetics which tells us that there were migrations of homo sapiens out of africa homo sapiens as professor asha sarangi mentioned have had about 70000 years of articulate life 
that is while homo sapiens were in the making for several uh, a, a couple of million years and at least for 5 lakh years uh, with very specific skills of weapon making like stone tools and so on at least handling things holding the hold of the using fingers for the last 70000 years homo sapiens have spoken and not spoken like birds and fish not simple tones complex sentences that is what we call language i should add here that by language i understand as follows i do not know if my consciousness is a myth i have made for myself or if it is there there are many many phenomenological questions related to my consciousness in my mind and i just don't know what immanuel kant would have called the phenomenal world whether it exists out there or it is a dream that whether it is maya ya bala or what i don't know but one thing i am sure and that is there is a bridge connecting the consciousness and the phenomenal world and that bridge is language and without language had there been no language we would not have been able to spot the stars in the sky we would not have been able to name them and therefore know them because we do not know what we do not name in order to know something you have to name it and therefore language is the bridge between the human consciousness and the phenomenal world so i am speaking of that language 70000 years of the lingual life of the homo sapiens the consciousness of those early ancestors of ours was engaging with the outside world by using language and they arrived here they 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 migrated they migrated because they could weaponize language language became language became their guard their weapon uh, in order to move forward move, move ahead in their migration uh, defending themselves they arrived here first 65000 years before our time then another 45000 years before our time some of them went to south india what we call south india they would not have called it south or north at that time they were, might be having different words for directions uh they they migrated in several waves but not not these waves were not daily waves these were spaced in time with large gaps in between and when they came here if they found food which was there as hunter gatherers they had to find animals and if they found enough animals they settled at places and some moved ahead and those who settled if there are students of anthropology here you would know that there is a technical term in anthropology called the population knot k n o t if there is a, a group size of about 8 to 900 persons they stay at one place they tend to stay on they do not find it necessary to migrate unless there is a shortage of food or shortage of energy or water some natural resource population not swear form where they settled and since they moved into this area it was not known as india or south asia perhaps i don't know what name they would have used i don't know if they had an idea of the map of this whole subcontinent perhaps not perhaps yes i don't know we don't know it as it but these different groups developed their own language when they splintered in different groups one group used one form of the language that was inherited another group that moved on added to it terms related to nature this stage of 
development of languages continued in this i am using the term country in a popular way and not in a technical way this this of uh, this uh, kind of state of affairs continued in this country in our part of the world until agriculture came here from iran that's about 7000 years before our time roughly 5000 years before christ by then hundreds of languages had taken root and evolved and had absorbed terms related to ecology terms related to animal life and birds and if it had not happened it would be surprising we cannot deny the fact that such languages developed here when agriculture came while the technology of agriculture came from iran towards the east the nomenclature related to those processes happened to be native nomenclatures i mean take a simple test while persian and english language are widespread here and we accepted so many words look at the terms that are used for farming and agriculture in any part of the country and you will find that they are neither from persian nor from sanskrit nor from english they are pre sanskrit pre persian pre english many languages in india has been the backdrop for subsequent developments in this country till about two thousand years before christ that's four thousand years before our time this was the linguistic situation of the country and if i had some way of going back to that time i would simply find there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of languages being spoken by people about 1500 years before christ that's 500 years after the decline of the indus civilization a new language entered this part of the world and that is uh, that is a branch of the indo european languages uh, developing into indo iranian indo aryan and later which we later called the sanskrit language sanskrit was a refined form of that language but when it was coming it was moving from eurasian steppes uh, there is the question did it come from here there to here or did it go from here to there the answer is not given by me the answer is given by horses horses were not native to this country and horses allowed the eurasians to to pull their carts at a speed which was unprecedented allowing those horse carts to be used as weapon launching arrow launching platform giving them a definite superiority uh, arm superiority and that helped them in expanding from the, from the eurasian uh, civilizations small towns big towns the uh, sintashta mitanni and so on uh, but i'll not get into that history all that i want to say that when sanskrit came and i am i am extremely fond of the sanskrit language it's a great language is one of the greatest languages that world has ever produced i'm not saying the greatest there are many great languages there is for instance in maharashtra in buldhana district a uh, a language being spoken in three talukas and that's a great language because it has been in existence for the last 35000 years nehali is the name all the linguists in the world are looking at that language today they have not been able to decide the precise ancestry of that language they have not been able to place it in any language families 
सो दैट्स अ ग्रेट लैंग्वेज इन माई ओपिनियन संस्कृत इज एज ग्रेट एज द नेहाली लैंग्वेज इज वाई नॉट एक्सेप्ट इट वेन संस्कृत केम हियर इट ब्रॉट अबाउट अ चेंज इन इंडिया एंड इंडिया वॉज मेड अगेन through the earlier phase that i described which was a long phase which also covers your know, indus civilization india had developed population north which means in other words it had developed the idea of a village the village india was made at that time of course the city india collapsed the indus civilization collapsed uh, but uh, that's a different story with the arrival of the sanskrit we created we started creating india differently by bringing in a new expression of language which we can call literature prior to the sanskrit uh, expression we do not have any known source of literature in this country and we have to accept it the vedic if vedas can be called literature it is the first instance of literature we have but more important than that that new arrangement of india <coughs> brought in the idea of abstraction which allowed humans to imagine gods humans to imagine an existence which is beyond the human existence it also allowed humans to create what we now call philosophy when i speak of that particular moment in time 1500 years before christ i am not just staying there i am going down in history uh, coming uh, way beyond the christian i mean uh, the years of christ it is in those 1500 years prior to christ that we had buddhism we had the jaina philosophy uh, we had the epics and so on and uh, Uh, we have to appreciate the fact that buddha who did not use the sanskrit language and preach in other languages was dealing with extremely sophisticated philosophical categories indicating that the languages in which he was transacting had their existence at least for 500 or 1000 years prior to the time buddha started using those languages because an altogether new language cannot have the does not have the capacity to bear complex philosophical thoughts uh, i am thinking of jain i mean the jain thought this is the aparigra concept of aparigra or kalanu for instance kalanu is the atom of time aparigra is not holding with your you know not grabbing things that is the idea of property has to be there the idea of idea of profit has to be there i don't know if the idea of interest was there but greed uh, was there and and that means uh, supplies and uh, demands uh, tension had to be there in order for the jain thinkers to come up with such a concept which they were doing not in the sanskrit language but in some other languages prakrut or pali this new ordering of india put india in the framework of literature thinking about gods thinking about the state in a different way and therefore social legislation some of it is terrible some of it is not so terrible some of it can be even i mean uh, it can be you can call it progressive for those times i am not getting into the merit of what the legislation was i am not getting into the merit of what manusmriti was but the fact that these smritis could come up indicates that india was being shaped differently the location of shaping of india this time was not the same as the location of shaping of india that had happened previously previously this population north had gone all the way to the south and partly to the eastern of eastern areas of the subcontinent 
but this new shaping was happening primarily in the north on the western side and when it happened on the eastern side some of it had to perforce migrate to the western side the location had changed i'll now move further in this india was made once again you know what what kind of india it was so i'm not getting into the entire history of the, the period from 1500 years before christ up to 1000 years after christ 2500 years long period uh, uh, deserving at least 2500 books to be written about it but i i quickly move on to uh, move to a millennium before our time india started getting made once again when the sex started arising and what we call the saint poets came up whether it was the sufi influence or there is some deeper cause for the rise of the new movements we still have to investigate fully it's not sufficiently investigated but certainly the arrival of the persian has played a role our exposure to arabic has played a role turkish language that has played a role no doubt about it but there must be something in it within us which required this change perhaps we were trying to reset our equation with gods and that's why all the saints try to humanize god whether they were sufis or they were uh, they were uh, kabir panthis or they were followers of namdev or tukaram or uh, or uh, basveshwar humanize god bring the world back to the human sphere was the was the most intense uh, craving desire of that india by the way that india rejected the idea of literature as the previous india had accepted the idea of of literature that the sanskrit pali prakrut of a thousand years first millennium had accepted got rejected paper came in the picture all of you know and if you don't you should know that delhi was extremely prosperous in the 13th century because of the paper merchants of delhi most lucrative business in those days paper came and with the paper came democratization of language and a greater variety of diversity of language of the previous time if i if i look at the diversity of language i find sometimes mention of 8 or 10 or 15 languages in the mahabharat there is uh, the, you know at the adi parva there is a shloka he says ashtadash shatani sashtadash sastrani ashtadash shatani cha am veti shuko veti sanjay veti i don't know sanjay knows something shuka knows something different people of different caste three different caste varnas contributed to the mahabharat but it speaks of three when i go to panini's grammar panini is talking of various ways of speech Uh, but not 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 uh, over a single digit numeral when i come to the riti siddhant of the uh, let's say the uh, or the uh, or uh, kavya mimamsa of 6th or 7th century uh, i don't get names of more than 10 or 15 except in one one rare uh, manuscript Uh, which is uh, uh, which is about music brahad deshi there is naming of musical styles in different languages of india and the number is larger with the bhakti a era in the last 1000 years i would say first half of the last 1000 years the number of languages mentioned increases whether it is albaruni or ibn batuta or you name whichever traveler they naming our languages and you find many more names mentioned in those sources paper democratized language and democratization of language also helped in democratization of divinity earlier god was remote 
बट माय तुकाराम इन मराठी कूड फाइट विथ इज गॉड ही कूड अब्यूज इज गॉड अब्यूज इन आउट ऑफ अफेक्शन एज रामकृष्ण परमाउंस ऑफ लास्ट सेंचुरी वुड डू इट इन बेंगाल गेट एंग्री विथ गॉड गॉड बिकेम सखा दैट्स यार बिकेम बिलवेड गॉड बिकेम एट टाइम्स सर्वंट गॉड बिकेम आई मीन मेनी फॉर्म्स सो डिविनिटी वॉज ब्रॉड क्लोजर पेपर हेल्प एस इन ब्रिंगिंग गॉड क्लोजर एस एंड लैंग्वेज इज न्यू लैंग्वेज इज स्टार्टेड इमर्जिंग इफ आई लुक एट द हिस्ट्री ऑफ गुजराती लैंग्वेज ऑफ बांग्ला लैंग्वेज ऑफ ओरिया लैंग्वेज ऑफ मोस्ट ऑफ द इंडो आरियन लैंग्वेज इज आफ्टर द इलेवन सेंचुरी दे स्टार्ट इमर्जिंग एज इंडियन लैंग्वेज मॉडर्न इंडियन लैंग्वेज इन द साउथ द स्टोरी स्लाइटली डिफरेंट तमिल एग्जिस्टेड प्रीवियसली बट फ्रॉम तमिल कन्नड एड इमर्ज ए लिटल अर्लियर दैन इलेवन सेंचुरी बट मलयालम एंड तेलुगू इमर्ज ड्यूरिंग दोज थाउजेंड इयर्स न्यू लैंग्वेज पीपल गॉट न्यू लैंग्वेज पीपल स्टार्टेड ब्रिंगिंग इन द डायवर्सिटी टू लूज इन द कंट्रोल ऑफ सिस्टम्स दैट वेर सेट प्रीवियसली ए न्यू इंडिया गॉट मेड वंस अगेन एंड द लोकेशन दिस टाइम वॉज स्प्रेड ऑल ओवर इट वॉज देर इन आसाम इन शंकरदेव it was there in the south it was there in basveshwar in karnatak it was there in tyagaraj in gujarat it was everywhere india emerged from everywhere in every tongue and earlier in the previous era of the literature that i am calling it was the varna now it was the caste voices started emerging from every caste this india got unmade once again with the exposure that we had to the colonial uh, i mean to uh, colonialism and once again uh, we had a new way of relating to language we built our bridges with the phenomenal world a new once again printing came in and what existed prior to that as literature suddenly got trashed as oral and printed alone became the real literary expression i i should have added that this similar thing had happened in the previous time also that is during the era of literature it was literary creativity philosophical creativity theological creativity religious creativity but 11th century onward indians brought in a new manifestation of language called translation there doesn't appear to be any translation in existence prior to the 11th century in our country but that there, there was rewriting of a manuscript but no translation 11th century onward translation was brought in as a linguistic expression similarly uh, gnandeva's uh, geet uh, commentary on the gita was translation of the gita and then commentary and so many translations of mahabharata and ramayan tulsi ramayan is one of those with with uh, the coming of the printing all of that became got got relegated to the domain of the oral and therefore non literature the colonial phase made india differently languages acquired a new life particularly in the 19th century great literary efflorescence could be seen in bangla in marathi in kannada tamil hindi every language major language and people started producing printed literature for constructing the society differently and it came up from everywhere once again the nation was expanding india was expanding over this over these eras india was expanding that with our independence we struck a new relationship with language diversity and in the constitution 
we were given the eight schedule. Uh, Professor Sarangi has done a lot of work on that particular uh, field, so I will be brief. But our nation accepted that India, if India becomes a nation, and when it becomes a nation, shall necessarily be a multilingual nation. And so the debates beginning with 1926 till 1949 all accepted that India, to be India, has to be a multilingual nation. This was a bold step, considering that we had accepted the spirit of nationalism from Europe. And in Europe, there were at least two instances of rather militant monolingual nationalism. One was Italy, in unification of Italy, and the second was Germany, in unification of Germany. The single language, dominant language, created their nations, and we know the results in the 20th century. It is only these two countries that turned up to promote fascism in the 20th century. India had seen this and therefore decided that it will be a multilingual country. It was a new India. In 1950, we became a republic, a new India, as a multilingual India. And I must thank the census officers for counting the number of languages in 1961, they gave a list of 1,652 mother tongues. That was India. For the last few decades, India is being made once again. And we come to some kind of climax at the moment there. I have given this broad brush picture of language diversity and making of India to show that there is no fixed idea of India in the past. It has kept changing. It has, every time it has changed, language has had a very deep link with that change. The change has affected this future of languages. Languages have affected that change as well. So far, we have not written a history of our place. I am rather hesitant using the term nation or country because it immediately restricts the idea of India to a particular uh, temporal uh, zone. Uh, so, we so far not written a history of our place in terms of language or languages. We should do it someday because it is a serious matter. I shall now tell you why it is a serious matter. Of the nations in the world that have maximum number of languages, India is among the first four nations. Papua New Guinea, Nigeria, Indonesia and India. These four have several hundred languages. I always used to think as to why it is these four that have several hundred languages and others don't have so many. And the simplest answer to that question was and is that these are the places where there was historically no food shortage. These are the, I mean, get into, please think of it anthropologically. These are the places which allowed maximum number of population knots to come into existence historically. I know that political interference has created artificial food shortage. I am aware of that. I am aware of the 19th century, what happens in the 19th century and 20th century. So, but I am thinking of long past, of about 60,000 or 50,000 years. These four areas were surplus in food, plenty of animal life, I am not talking of vegetarian food, I am talking of real food. <coughs> I mean, of 70,000 years of human history, about 7,000 years is agriculture, 63,000 years is without agriculture. 
therefore i use the term real food <coughs> because we had no food shortage so many languages existed also because so many languages existed it was possible to tackle tap cope with every kind of ecological zone andaman was you no know, jarwas of andaman were mentioned by if you have a language to deal with your ecology zone then you have the best returns from that zone without creating a food shortage for your people having many languages was the insurance for the continuity of life and civilization in india one reason why indian civilization did not break down in between and continued forever and ever and ever is this engagement of the local community with the local eco- ecosystem and for that engagement of the local people with local ecosystem the local language was the necessity india has this great language diversity traditionally and i mentioned with pride and we there are many things to be proud about the, uh, among the top very few uh, oldest surviving languages in the world i mean if you are looking at the guinness uh, book of world records tamil is one etc uh, etc et but i can mention many uh, uh, language which created maximum number of poetic meters india has that language but i am not going i am not going to the guinness book i am thinking of something different this language diversity has come under threat the language diversity which made us who we are has come under threat in the last 50 years and the threat has intensified increase in the last 30 years and has come to almost a climax in the last few years very quickly i'll go over it and then then i'll explain what that threat is and why it is there i said that 16th uh, 1652 mother tongues were listed in the 61 census but in 1971 census this number was brought down to 109 1550ish kind of languages were wiped out mother tongues were wiped out of the census the reason was that you know this language data comes out normally 6 or 7 years after the census takes place and in the 70s early 70s bangladesh became a separate nation independent nation on the question of language and so our government felt that showing showcasing too much of language diversity would be disastrous for unity of the country because in those days unity was a great theme just as it has now resurfaced <coughs> so uh, the names were wiped out of course they were reinstated subsequently but very sadly i have to say i mean i have to say uh, two things rather sadly i i am going to be sad twice <coughs> uh, the first time i am sad Uh, saying that the 20 uh, 2021 census has just not taken place we don't know if if we exist in the country or not we don't know how many people there are uh, what they uh, uh, what is their hemoglobin level what number of schools and all that uh, so one is sad because if there is no data then there is no existence uh, the uh, second thing i am sad about is that in 19 uh, 2011 census 2011 census which is available last census the number of mother tongues listed in the census was 1369 that is as against 1652 mother tongues 50 years ago now we are 1369 mother tongues that's that's very clearly simple arithmetic 280 mother tongues have literally died actually died in 71 it was concealment of data But this time is actual data i mean and it shows that 280 mother tongues have died and that's a very big number of dying languages for us in a period of 50 years 
If I were to compare the rate of death of languages in Papua New Guinea, in <coughs> Indonesia, in uh, Nigeria, uh, I find that we are not lagging behind any of those countries. We are a little ahead of them. And if we continue it this way, we might be left with not 1360 mother tongues 10 years from now, but maybe 500 mother tongues. And in another 10 years, we might be left with just 200 mother tongues. And yet another 10 years, we might be left with about 100 languages. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm not trying to terrify you. This is what is happening to language. Whose mother tongues are going? The denotified and nomadic tribes. The people who were wrongly branded as criminal tribes during the colonial times and who chilled and who never got any justice they had to spend several generations in soft prisons and who children you see sailing balloons at every crossroads in Delhi or those little things at the crossings their languages because they are suspected forever as criminals and they are, they are uh, mob lynch they are hounded out of cities and villages. They feel shy of speaking their languages and their languages have gone or going. These are at least 190 such communities in India, denotified and nomadic communities in India, whose languages are almost sunk, almost gone. Each of their languages has words with different kind of knowledge related to birds and animals. The Hakki Pikis of Karnatakas, the bird catchers, they know so much about birds that they would be knowing that bats bring your virus. Go and find out how many Pardis died during Corona and you will find that the number is surprisingly less. The languages of the coastal communities have disappeared. I am not saying they are disappearing because the entire coastal area is given to uh, corporates and therefore the fishing people have no livelihood. They have moved inland, deserting their languages. I used to know a language called Kharwa in Gujarat. About 5 lakh of young people used to get together every year for one week to decide how to get married. Girls and boys had to stay together for 8 days and choose their life partners. They no longer get together. They are nowhere to be seen there. I mean I am mentioning this gathering of 30 years ago. It is gone. The Kharwa language has disappeared. I can go on mentioning names of the languages that are, the coastal people of this country have lost their languages. The denotified and nomadic tribes are losing their languages and many of the Adivasis are losing their languages. Who are these people? These are the smallest margins of our society. You remember this anti-CA agitation? It was because the law said that the, that uh, Jains, Buddhists, Christians, uh, Hindus, Parsis, etc., etc., will uh, get citizenship if they if they are forced due to persecution from Bangladesh, Afghanistan, or Pakistan. That did not mention the names of twelve tribal communities in Bangladesh, who are traditionally migrant communities moving between. You know, from one side of Brahmaputra to other side of Brahmaputra. Twelve tribal communities who are the smallest persecuted religious groups because they are independent religions as listed in the census of Bangladesh and as listed in the census of India. They were not. So was there any agitation for them in this country? No. These small minorities are losing languages. <coughs> the diversity will shrink because of this. But these are only 
some known facts you know something which we know rather easily that i mentioned there's something not known to us that i want to mention should i stop now i already gone over time okay uh, but i'll take about 5 minutes with your permission i wanted to say that neurologists have studied the human brain to find that there is a great fatigue in the brain in the broca's loop side of the brain that is people will no longer read in future children do not read you know as the professors know their students no longer read books even professors who used to read books no longer read books the same professor so it's a fact it's it's not their fault it is something has happened to the brain in the process of the evolution and it will continue humans are rapidly trying to enter a virtual world the cyberspace they want to cease to be physical and be only digital that's the craving everywhere and in that digital world in that cyberspace there is no room for human languages natural languages in that world the digits replace words the past tense the present and the future collapse together our idea of time and space have no meaning in that world that world has no space for languages meant for earth bound consciousness it has space only for interplanetary kind of you know, movement and colonization and communication and therefore it is a sure future of human languages that they will disappear and will enter a zone of silence it is in that transition from natural language and natural language diversity to shrinking of the diversity and disappearance of natural languages that dictatorships all over the world have emerged since my time is over i wanted to say maybe a one another sentence people uh, who have become reckless individualist consumers have also become a bit scared of everything and have gone into compulsively habitually gone into the insurance regime because there no courage every coward wants to have an insurance it's a fact <clears throat> to the extent that americans now are insuring insurance <laughs> and and some of us who are more affluent here will be doing it soon if they are not already done it such people like regimes that form regulations giving an illusory sense of you know illusory comfort of order and protection and these people then you know raise hands and allow the totalitarian regimes to come up all over the world the totalitarian regime and the shrinking of language and the loss of courage and our alienation from ecology or are parts of the same parcel which we are handling as a ticking bomb and it's not more than a couple of decades from now that we may be mentioning the word democracy as a historical term applied to a foolishly idealistic socialistic people there is a way to fight that and that way is to work on language diversity because diversity defeats any totalitarian design but my concern is not defeating you know this or that regime i i i, I really don't care i'm being frank my concern is far graver and that concern is 
we in india were made several times over as a linguistic civilization and every time we turned no we 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 turned skin we changed skin and became a new civilization linguistically that's the method that we invented this is the only civilization where word is worshiped if we do not care for our method of creating civilization how shall we fight the onset of a new virtual world which is wiping out human civilization language diversity and making of india are subjects on which each one of us must think speculate getting out of our present frames more seriously and maybe some day some of you who are younger will find a solution as to how to keep our diversity and our language alive because we need our democracy and our sense of justice and equality to remain alive thank you so much